I have always identified racially as human and culturally as Black. This is Nkechi Amare Diallo, better known to most as Rachel Ann Dolajal, up until her name change in 2016 to this Nigerian phrase, meaning gift of God. We'll call her Rachel for this episode. She says for press, she doesn't mind. And this is what happened. As you can hear, Rachel culturally identifies as Black. But during at least the infamous year of 2014 to 2015, there is plenty of ambiguity around how she racially identified as well. A loud and proud activist for Black and civil rights, whose good work in the community even got her elected as the branch president of the NAACP in Spokane, Washington, Rachel presented aesthetically as a Black woman. And if you look at her then and now, with a head full of braids, a golden tan and brown freckles, I mean, sure, okay, it makes sense. And for a while, all of this went under the radar because Rachel was the radar. But public interest was piqued after allegations that she had been the victim of race-related hate crimes came under scrutiny. And then in 2015, Rachel's parents outed her as being born biologically white. While Rachel acknowledged that she was born to white parents, she maintained that she self-identified as Black, which pissed a lot of people off. I affiliate more with Black culture than white culture and values. And um, yeah, so I mean, it's pretty simple. (laughs) Culture isn't biological either, by the way. This episode is going to be a two-parter. There's just too much to unpack in one, so be sure to listen on after part one. This is also our final episode in season one of Homegoings, and it's the final one for a reason. Because though I interviewed Rachel in July, it's taken me this long to figure out a way to share it. Or even if I wanted to. Most of us haven't really thought about Rachel's controversy for a while. And for some, not thinking about her has been intentional, an act of resistance even, because her story felt hurtful and offensive and deceptive. But for others, her story is relatable. For people like Martina Big, who was featured on Maury in September 2017. She's a woman of white ancestry who identifies as Black and has had tanning injections administered by a physician to darken her skin and her hair. Or Ollie London, who's a British influencer who previously identified as Korean and had numerous plastic surgeries to affirm his racial identity. Or even Corla Pandit, born John Roland Red a Black American musician who posed as an Indian from New Delhi in both his public and private life. So like it or not, there are more people like Rachel Dolezal out there. Which means that racial identity, everything we know about it and all that comes with it, often inherently like culture and heritage, is very recently, seemingly, up for discussion in terms of choice and flexibility. It's up for grabs. And this not only challenges me, as a Black woman, it makes me immensely curious. I'm curious about Rachel, the human, the mother, and what she's been up to since all this went down. People are like, oh, I just don't care what people think. I'm like, well, but when what people think means you can't get a job, you know, when what people think means that you're going to have people taking pictures of you when you're at the grocery store and you're just really trying to get your, you know, kid with autism through grocery shopping, you know, or whatever, like, that's when it matters, in a, in a sense. I'm curious how the conversation about what's been dubbed transracialism, a word describing a person who identifies as a different race than the one associated with their biological ancestry, has changed, or hasn't. You know, gender identity and expression is being um, honored and on the U.S. Census, it says that, you know, these are, this is self-identifying form. You're self-identifying, you know, where you belong on this form. And it's not, if, if race is not a biological essentialism, a fate that we're born into, then I think, you know, we're all the human race. And we then are free to find the culture that we really resonate with and that feels like home. And then, of course, there's this nagging question that scares me the most. And that is, what if she's right? 
the book by Audrey Smedley really opened my eyes to race being a social construct and that it's something that we do. It's a behavior. It's something that we not only um, have, we being just human beings, um, particularly European um, colonists <laughs> have created over history, right? And have put this script, these stereotypes on people. And if you're white, you're, you're you know, you're born with a silver spoon. And, and then if you're black, you, you know, are going to struggle and, you know, all these other things. And some of that still is true just because of that creation. But there's also um, that sense of like, what are we going to do with the individual? From Vermont Public, this is Homegoings. I'm Myra Flynn. Today, on part one of this final episode of season one, a conversation with the perplexing, nuanced, and controversial Rachel Dolezal about the choice or lack thereof in racial identity. We stop seeing people as human beings that are on the opposite side because they're a threat. We'll dig further into what Rachel's story brings up for us as individuals. This whole situation and and Rachel's whole story brings up more questions than it does answers. And unpack the cultural fallout that can and has happened when the social construct of race is threatened to be deconstructed. So she has witnessed it. She can read the books. But there's not the internal 4,094th ancestors that we bring with us. This is Homegoings. We're a proud member of the NPR Network. And this is part one of a two-part episode we're calling Erasing Race, a conversation with Rachel Dolezal. Welcome. There were a lot of barriers to to get to you and had to really prove that I was not out to like harm or uh, take things out of context. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about like why that is. I've experienced that mostly with the media is they want to take and then they want to exploit. And so they want to frame a question in a way that's a gotcha question and then take that snippet and go exploit it, make it go viral. Maybe we're going to do an hour interview. Only three minutes of that is going to be seen ever by anyone. And it's going to be those three minutes where they got me to say one little part of thing and then, you know, ch- chopped it off. And um, the the other 20 minutes of what I said or the other, you know, 60 minutes or however long the interview was never see the light of day. So I've had that happen over and over and over. And just the disappointment of the investment of time and energy to express myself, even even my children expressing themselves and feeling like their words were twisted um, against me and against our family. And it just it's just been a very brutal process. Given Rachel's experience with the media, this interview was a tough get. In fact, when I said there were barriers to getting near her, to call them barriers is generous. It's more like a barbed wire fence. I had hours of conversations with her manager before they'd even agree to let me near Rachel. And there were a lot of concerns about what I would or wouldn't ask her, and fair warning about what she would and wouldn't respond to, like direct questions about her identity or re-upping her scandal and past. And if I did get the interview, her manager would need to be present, able to shut the whole thing down should it go left. And this makes sense to me. After all, It was the media that altered Rachel's entire life. In June of 2015, while she was deep in her work as an activist for Black and civil rights, a local TV news crew interviewed her and asked, Are you African American? Rachel froze, turned from the camera, and walked away. The footage of that interview went viral, and not the good kind of viral. All this to say, the barbed wire, I get it. And and I think it's just, it's tough when... You become infamous 
without consent, you know, without your control. I'll admit I've been doing some mental somersaults with this episode, and here's why. I don't want to participate in Rachel's scandal. Her story blew up a long time ago, and frankly, it just isn't news. And I am interested in her humanity, genuinely, so I don't desire to dehumanize her. But I don't want to write Rachel a love letter either. Part of being human is people pushing back on you, disagreeing with you, and disagreeing is not dehumanizing. And I think part of a good interview is holding space and being willing to listen with an open mind and even questioning my own beliefs, which I've done plenty of in this episode. In fact, not questioning some of these things feels dehumanizing to me. So Rachel, if you're listening, I do indeed relish the nuance of your story. And I hope you can relish the nuance of mine. There are a lot of race essentialists and race essentialists just are people who actually believe that race is biological and it's again a fate you're born into and that is unchangeable and you know but science has proved that race is is an archaic idea um, when it comes to the human race being divided into separate races because the human race doesn't meet the zoological requirements for those racial divisions So yeah, racially I'm human, you know, surprise, surprise. Here's the thing about Rachel. I think you'll hear today that a lot of her thoughts on race, in particularly race as a social construct, they aren't technically, biologically, or even anthropologically wrong. But her process for getting us to understand her points, i.e. identifying as Black culturally and aesthetically, are so unusual, they aren't really based in a reality all of us are living in or even could if we wanted to. For many of us, there's no choice. We can't pass or change our appearance enough to have choice in our racial identity. And I got questions about this stuff and about the impact and the fallout of her actions and her choices. Questions Rachel mostly didn't want to talk about, but I wanted to talk about with someone. Um, and I got in the car and drove here about three hours. Three to be hours? It's a three-hour drive. Oh, my God. These are my someones. I wasn't going to pull this thing apart alone, so I put together an in-studio panel of some of the mouthiest folks I know. You'll be hearing from us as kind of a Greek chorus throughout this episode. There's Mia Schultz. She uses she, her pronouns, and is president of the Rutland, Vermont NAACP chapter. However, today I'm just um, here to comment for myself, not in... in Not with uh, the NAACP in mind, not with um, not speaking their messages, I should say. There's a little disclaimer there. And um, I identify as a mixed race black woman. Yes. All right. You mean you can't speak for all of the NAACP and all the black people all over the world Uh, for us today? Go figure. I cannot do that today. Nope. There's Kwame Danqua. His pronouns are he, him, and he's a program director and afternoon host on 95 X, another radio station in Burlington, Vermont. And um, I identify as African-American and Ghanaian because I'm exactly 50-50, literally African-American as you can get. Um, and I am here courtesy of myself and for the engagement of the conversation. And then there's me. My father is white and predominantly Irish, hence the last name Flynn. And my mother is Black American. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify solely as Black. Though as a biracial person, I acknowledge the privilege that comes with being lighter skinned, and my proximity to whiteness is pretty close. I am not having a buy anything experience. Not in my home, not at the grocery store, and not when I get pulled over. So, When it comes to how I identify, I consider my ethnic makeup more of a technicality than anything, which, if I'm honest with myself, is the kind of flexible thinking around race that brings us here today. So um, I'm going to start with a question. When was the last time you all thought about Rachel Dolezal? And 
What was that thought? I follow her on Instagram, actually. I follow her on Instagram because I just, after the story first broke. This is the tea. This is the tea. You follow her. I follow her on Instagram because after the story first broke in 2015, and I was actually in Rutland at the time, and I was getting ready to move to Washington where she was for a job. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see, okay, who is this person and how is their life going to shake up? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think. And now about, we know. And now we know. Now we know about Kwame yes. and who he follows. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, I don't think about her. Um, but I did actually think about her recently. I would say within the last year or so. I want to say there's like a docu series or something on Netflix, and I checked out like half an episode. Yeah, the Rachel Divide. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah I checked out half of an episode and was like, no. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I, like I have bigger things to worry about than what this white lady's doing. Woo! I said it. You said what you said, <laughs> and you said what you said. Yeah. Um, well, I have this thing um, where I might be a little overly curious to the point that uh, it's a problem, right? Because I don't want to do any harm, right? But at the same time, this show is about nuanced conversations about race. And then I was like, who's the most nuanced person I could think of when it comes to a conversation about race? Let's start with Rachel Dolezal. So, uh... (laughs) I am 45 years old and I'm a mother of three sons and I live in Tucson, Arizona. I love to garden. I'm an artist. I love to educate all age levels. I My current hairstyle right now is uh, butterfly locks. I was a braider for 26 years. In preparation for this interview, my whole house was nothing but Rachel research for nearly four months. I read most articles written about her, watched most interviews, and yeah, I did revisit the Netflix documentary. I also read her book in full color since she said anything in there was fair game. I wasn't really sure what I was digging for in the mountain of research. Maybe a reason? A reason for this racial cultural transition beyond the scandal we already knew about Rachel. I think I was digging for Rachel's humanity. And when you're doing that, childhood is always a good place to start. Well, well, we were poor. We were always poor. Rachel was born in rural Montana in 1977 to her parents Ruth and Larry Dolezal. They were living off the land, and Rachel says even the kids were responsible for maintaining it. Up to 13 hours a day was spent on chores. There was no TV, no electronic devices, and according to Rachel, if she and her brothers didn't do things just right, they got beat. And much of this went down in the name of God. Rachel says her parents were fundamentalist Christians, and much of the way they lived was framed around a strict interpretation of the Bible, including a strong belief in creationism and Puritan-like commitment to simple living. In fact, in Rachel's memoir is a copy of her birth certificate. In the bottom right-hand corner, where a witness or other attendant to her birth would typically be named, it reads, Jesus Christ himself. According to Rachel, her parents did a lot of things in the name of God, like adopting four black kids between 1993 and 1995 into this rural, white, subsistence lifestyle. They were super pro-life or anti-abortion, and they wanted to not support abortion by um, paying taxes because they believed that part of the government funds of tax-paying dollars were going to fund Uh, abortions within the military. And so it was just kind of this whole thing of if they could not pay taxes, then they would not be funding abortions. And so if they adopted enough kids, you know, to have their tax return be greater than what they were paying, it would all be part of God's work, you know, so. When I reached out to Larry Dolezal to fact check this, he told me the financial implications were not part of the family's consideration when adopting. But yeah, the more dependents, the lower the taxes. 
And yes, abortion had a lot to do with it. One time, while the family was attending a peaceful pro-life rally in Libby, Montana, Larry says they were accosted by pro-life people who said, why do you want to save these babies anyway? Nobody wants them. Larry says they were referring specifically to black kids, which prompted a discussion in the family. Did they care about black kids? Did they want to be involved? At the time, both black children and children with disabilities were considered harder to place for adoption. But the Dolezals believed all children were made by God, so they went for it. Rachel has a different story about why they adopted black kids specifically. Ultimately, though, what's really heartbreaking about that adoption process is that a white child was $50,000 at that time um, for adoption fees, and black children were zero to $4,000. And so for their budget, they could only afford black kids. I checked on this, too, because this number for a white child seems absurdly high. Using the Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI inflation calculator, $50,000 is equivalent to around $114,000 today. Though I couldn't find this exact number, I learned that race-based adoption fees are well attested, specifically for Montana during this time. I can say that there was a large fee gap between the two races. The Gap also considered things like private adoption versus public or foster adoption. Bottom line, black kids were cheaper. And Larry did confirm with me that although he did not adopt these children because they were cheaper, adoption costs for all four kids was around $25,000. So up the mountain they went. course they had a daughter who was in high school who was able to take care of babies so she could homeschool that being me um and take care of all these babies right so it was like a win-win um they didn't even have enough money to to buy diapers and so I sewed cloth diapers for four babies <laughs> literally out of uh, flannel and other fabrics that we had because we made our own clothes on the mountain this is like early 1900s living. As long as they're babies and they could put little, um, they could put little pictures of them in their little Christian newsletter, they were useful. And as soon as they started to get a little bigger and started to question and assert themselves in life and wanted to be empowered more, then um, they became a threat. And it's, it's something that, um, you know, nobody wants to live through knowing that corporal punishment and abuse was occurring and also just loving these children so much and not being able, not having the rights to save or protect each one of them in those moments um, because I was a sibling and not their legal parent. Larry did confirm some more things to be true about Rachel's story. Well, more than expected. Like, yes, corporal punishment was a thing, though he wouldn't characterize it as abuse. It's what they believed was best for all the children's discipline, and he doesn't believe anyone was emotionally scarred by it. Also, though they are what they would consider to be middle class now, they did grow up in a shack before they bought their land. But Larry says that was for a brief time, and he wouldn't describe them as poor. Eventually, Rachel did become the parent to one of her siblings. In 2010, she obtained legal guardianship of her brother, Isaiah. Her Instagram is peppered with photos of him living his best life, with boasting posts of how proud she is of him. He even recently got engaged. Yeah, um, I bonded with my younger siblings and I did my darndest to <laughs> protect them from as much as I could and always will love them and care for them and uh, be there for them. So I know that we were talking about this interview and I went and I was 
you know, back to my Greek chorus, Mia Schultz and Kwame Danqua. As she moved out of where she was from, she grew up in Montana, and her parents had adopted four black children, and how she had more so connected with them than even her own family. And she had moved down south, and people began to suspect that she may have been biracial or really light-skinned African-American. And as a result, when she would correct them, they would feel like, oh, well, we don't want to talk to her. We can't, you know. So as a result, she stopped correcting people so that they would feel more, they would feel more comfortable around her. And as a result, she felt more comfortable in her own skin because she didn't identify with the hardcore, devout, Christian, right-wing roots that she grew up with. One of the things that I have noticed, especially from reading her book, is the part of me that is black. No, the part of me that is... All of you is black. What? No, no, no. But but there's, but you know, (laughs) the part of me that is like a very liberal understanding person is, I want to meet people where they are. And I want to identify people as they tell me to, as they tell me they want to be identified, no matter how much I don't understand. The part of me that is a black man with both roots in Ghana and here is like, how dare you? And I'm at this cognitive dissonance state because I can, I'm looking through the narrative that she's telling and I'm looking through her eyes and I can see where she's saying, this is how I feel. I never connected with this. But as a black person, I feel like it is my moral obligation to be outraged at this story she's telling, even if she feels that she never did anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Does what Kwame's saying speak speak to you or I, you just like had no you're like uh i had no compassion <laughs> from well, the start no, i do have compassion like there could be real trauma linked to this and i think we all have traumas and it influences how we interact in the world so i want to be um empathetic to that mm-hmm. and then i think also i am angry right there's the the part that like Kwame was mentioning about our blackness right we are like amazing people black people are amazing. We do amazing things. Say it louder, say it louder. Yes, we do. We do amazing things and we know that we do those amazing things. We're like uh, in in entertainment and science and academia, like we have a whole term called black girl magic, right? Because we know that our, our amazingness comes from our ancestry. It comes from these generations of resilience and weathering through things and um, you know, all of that context that makes us great, that historical context. And then the way that we fight for our children is like wrapped up in that. And so I'm offended that she is like kind of appropriating our history. I mean, it's an insult to our ancestors. What we're contending with is that, you know, the hurt kind of comes from borrowing or stealing somebody else's, you know, inherent culture that comes along with race. Appropriation. Appropriation. That's what I'm most offended by. There's a word. Mm, That's the word. That's the word. But Rachel does not believe that she is white. It's complex. It's complex as hell. After learning more about Rachel's complex upbringing, I'll admit, I've been developing some armchair theories about her. I can't help it. For one, I can begin to see an empathetic and actually pretty compassionate through line forming here as to why maybe she began to eventually align with blackness as a form of resistance against her whiteness. Given the alleged history of abuse that went on in her house, I can understand her wanting to get as far away from her parents as possible even if that meant denial of their shared ethnicity. And secondly, she was pretty much raising her black siblings. It makes sense to me that in order to protect them best, she would do her best to see the world through their eyes. I put my theory to Rachel. Yeah, I think that that's the kind of through line that makes the most sense to people as kind of, you know, the moral of the story or whatever, <clears throat> and that's fine. But even with my hand stretched out, with this compassionate guess of mine, 
as to why Rachel believes herself to be culturally Black, despite how much pain her choices have caused in Black communities and in her own life. Rachel does not take me up on this. In fact, since 2015, she's only doubled down on her truth that her Black identity has always been there, waiting to be awakened. I think it it was more than that, you know, not just some kind of like a savior complex or I felt sorry for some kids or something. It was like we we had a shared experience together. Some of the things that awakened in me while I was caring for them and some of the things that awakened in me while reading Black history, um, you know, I am still me aside from my siblings. You know, I'm not just me because of my siblings, if that makes sense. So my theory was a bust. And it's occurring to me along this journey that it might be time to just quiet the curiosity in my brain a little bit as to why Rachel identifies as Black and focus more on how she's been doing it. Because here's the thing. If you were to put together a checklist of the things that make one Black, she's got a lot on that list. In fact, if ethnicity is off the table and that checklist is the barometer, Rachel Rachel presents presents as the Blackest blackest person person I I know. There's her education at the HBCU of all HBCUs. These are historically black colleges and universities. I went to Mississippi to college. I went to Howard University, um, both without my siblings, you know. Besides her stint at the NAACP, there's the years she spent doing the work, both within communities, the black history classes she says she's petitioned for and helped to launch, and the work she's done to deeply educate herself. I mean, obtaining just these credentials alone would exhaust this Black woman. Literature, not just history, but nonfiction works, or fiction works as well as nonfiction. Um, And then, you know, instituting the first African-American history course at Bellhaven College that ever existed, that still exists today (laughs) when I was an undergrad. Quick note to say that I reached out to Bellhaven to confirm this, and by the time this came together, still didn't get a response. According to her Eastern Washington University faculty bio, Rachel has taught a class called The Black Woman's Struggle, though a public statement from the university distances itself from her work, saying she's been hired since 2010 on a quarter-by-quarter basis as an instructor in the Africana Education Program. This is a part-time position to address program needs. Rachel is not a professor. The university does not feel it is appropriate to comment on issues involving her personal life. The university does not publicly discuss personnel issues. So what I take from that is a lot of people abandoned Rachel after this scandal. What we do know is that people distancing themselves from her, it's not unfamiliar. Rachel says she even got lessons in what it feels like to be marginalized from early in her childhood. Being second class as kids, we were kids, so we're under the authority. And then the girls had another layer under. And the Black kids kind of were also almost like at the level of the girls, you know, in that sense. So it was just, it was, it were some of those dynamics of sexism and racism and patriarchy and white supremacy and just rural whiteness and poverty and all those factors kind of coming together where I did feel a kinship, not just randomly. It was like we were being treated in this in a similar way. So this list, if you check every box and then some, as Rachel does, might just justify your cultural blackness. Sure. But it turns out it's not even this list or other things that could be added to the Black experience, like innovation, resourcefulness, our glory, our joy, our music, our deep and soulful ways of cooking, dancing, or even loving that resonates with Rachel the most. If I'm hearing her correctly, what resonates about being Black is our pain. I think every story needs to be heard. And in that way, I just, you know, I do feel like my story is, it should be heard more as Um, maybe one of survival, maybe one of, um, you know, determination and persistence. And I also resonated with the literature and the history that I was reading and, and like gained a lot of inspiration to be resilient and to carry on. A lot of people comment like, you're so resilient, you know, I mean, (laughs) 
who are the ancestors that were resilient when we when we get back to it um you know you might have to go back a couple thousand years in your lineage but we're all gonna be able to find some ancestors eventually and we go back to the initial mother and father of everyone in the african continent That was part one of Erasing Race, a conversation with Rachel Dolezal. Part two is out now, and you can find it wherever you found this episode. In part two, we're going to get into some of the cultural reverberation Rachel's story brought up for America writ large. We have to ask ourselves why we really cared so much about a biologically white woman from Montana who decided to identify as Black. Can we even name the nerve she struck? That's up next. That's up next. 